this guy trying to take over the show. Look at this. This is the continuation of the main green screen hang. Day three, and the, the, the train has come off the rails here inside the Zebra Summit. Here we go. Louis Tucci here live again inside the famous Noman School of Visual Effects store. All around us, you can see uh, the wares. We've got everything from statues to books to DVDs. How do you guys feel about being in this incredible environment? It's awesome. Just use that guy right there. It's so they can. awesome. <laughs> Super awesome. Um, yeah, I don't know if he can get a little bit of the, uh, if he turns the camera a, a slight tad, he might get the, uh, the derriere or the... Butt cheeks. The, yeah, well, he said the butt cheek, but, you know, there we go, all the way from the butt of the issue. We're here back for day three inside the Zebra Summit with the guys from Bethesda. I'm sitting here with Dennis Mejionis. Very good. And uh, basically, Lucas Hardy, that's Hardy with an I, not to be confused with, uh, I'm getting off the plane. Uh, that other Hardy, Tom Hardy. Let's talk a little bit about something very important uh, right out of the gate. You guys are probably one of the funniest uh, well, combos. I, I'll take that. Yeah, that we've had. You, honestly, I mean, the fans were in the audience. They were laughing their pants off, and it was quite, you know, tongue-in-cheek. We were trying to distract from the lack of content. Yeah. Sure. We admit, not, you know, give him the microphone for a second. Oh. We, he's trying to say that we, yeah, you, you hold it. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm getting at. That's a continuation. Right here, of is this where I put it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, all right. These guys are giving me and Paul a run for the money. You guys want to host the rest of the program or what? I take the day off and What's go eat some tacos? Right? <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit first and foremost. I want to firstly say, Bethesda, the studio needs no introduction at this point. Uh, we're dealing with uh, an award-winning studio. Game of the Year honors, I have to go through. I have to write this down because there's so much that I have to get through that I, I would not be able to remember this. Uh, Game of the Year honors for 2006, Elder Scrolls. Awesome. Game of the Year Honors 2008 Fallout 3. Game of the Year Honors 2011 Elder Scrolls 5 Skyrim. And most recently, 2015 Game of the Year Fallout 4. Like, you guys are literally on par with Daniel Day-Lewis, the video games. They're coming in every couple of years to take your award and then disappearing back into the realm of creativity. Let's talk about the, the process of uh, being involved in those types of things and how does it make you feel to be here um, as representatives of that that kind of company. Yeah. Well, uh, Take it away, Lucas. Hart. Yeah, somebody who's worked at other studios in the past, and you're never really sure how the game's going, and is it? Sometimes you're not even sure if it's going to get canceled or if it's going to come out. It's really nice to work at a studio and at a place where you have a lot of trust. Everybody around you is going to be able to pull together a game that's going to be great and that the the fans are going to love. So it makes a big difference in your kind of your day to day, you know, in your work, being able to invest yourself in it. And, and, uh, and do your best. Hey, Lucas, you're hitting on something very important. You're saying that the energy around the sort of titles that you're producing give you sort of confidence yeah. in knowing that, hey, this is a solid brand, a solid franchise. There's fans waiting. We know that there's an embedded... And, yes. and you're, whereas before, maybe you had some circumstances. Where, and this is a reality. Talk more about the well, realities just, I mean, of this the game in the game world. Is talk, it, talk to us about that. Yeah, it's a hit-driven industry. So most of the games that come out don't hit, and that means they're not profitable. So... If you're working on something like that, even if you did a great job, and even if your team did a great job, even if the game is great, sometimes the game just doesn't hit, you know, for whatever reason. Maybe another game came out just before you, the same kind of thing. You know, who knows? Um, and it happens. So to be in a place where you know the fans are fans of your studio, they're fans of your kind of work, and they're, they want more of it, that's just, it's a privilege, you know. It's a, it's a really, it's a great position to be in as a developer to have that opportunity to try and do something that they're going to like the next time around and we do our best to to live up to that expectation i think you were talking about that briefly for a moment there when you guys were discussing the uh, the redevelopment the reinvention of some of the characters mm -hmm. across the line uh inside of the fallout world and you're saying you know we take it a little further and and try to reinvent a little bit i think that's uh, that's an imperative yeah in some places they get a lot of pressure to put out a game every year right. or something like that and it's harder for them to have that space to look at every part of the game. Say, what do we really need to to do better, do newer, do differently, so that it's a fresh experience for the players. So it doesn't feel like, oh, we're just putting the same thing out every time. And we try and take our time to do that, and we try and um, look at everything with a critical eye and, and figure out what is what is it we need to work on going forward. Well, you've br you've brought us to a very interesting point of the conversation. I was going to wait for a little later to get into that, but I think uh, this is a tremendous uh, energy involved in this. Have you been involved in a situation where something got uh, carpeted or or terminated early, and you had some investment in it in your own um, personal experience, without naming names? Yeah, I mean, I've I've 
how have you dealt with that experience, more importantly, for the right. people at home? Well, uh, Never mind the fact that it didn't work. Sure. No, I mean, I think a lot of people, when you're, you're starting out and working in video games and you, you haven't had a job before, you do what you can to get a job, get your foot in the door, right? Yeah. So, you know, my first job, which wasn't even making video games, it was at a company that was making other stuff and they were trying to make a video game. There was very little chance that they were going to put that out. And so, you know, it didn't work out. We were trying our best, but I still got a lot of experience out of it. And then my portfolio from there helped me get to another studio. Right. That studio did some great work, but it also had some projects that nobody ever knew about that we would work on for a year or two. And they weren't great, you know? And the, when you're making a game, sometimes you don't know if, until you can play it. Until you can play it, you don't know, is this going to be fun? And so you work on it for a year or two. It's not fun. You've got to can it. There goes your work. This is a, an interesting thing. that I'm sure that, uh, you know, in film sometimes you think about, uh, like, who won the... Uh, Paul probably knows this. Uh, yell it out if you know Paul, because we can hear you from in here. Uh, you know, it's kind of like gearing up to try to win an Oscar, and then you get, you get sort of shanghaied with The Godfather coming out the same year. It's like, yeah. how could you, you know... <laughs> that's just the, the luck of the draw, I guess. Yeah, you know, there's yeah. some great films that came out that year, and people don't know what they were, because they're just overshadowed. Yeah, so, right? It's like just bad time. Go ahead, take that microphone and tell us about your experience with that. What? Oh, Jesus, here we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well placed, right? It's orchestrated, the whole thing. You guys are good. <laughs> that's what made it funny. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is that how that's okay? Yeah. Um, tell us what you think of that. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you see the habit movies and with games, and you have, uh, I'm trying to think of the most recent one that I remember. It just kind of got overshadowed. I thought, I thought it was like Tomb Raider, for example. Yeah. Actually, Tomb Raider came out right when Fallout came yeah. out. And it just, you know, and I heard, I mean, I heard it was a good game. I actually play it, but right. uh, there you go. You just get the, it's a good game. You just get distracted because yeah. the populace is like, you can only, the way that games have evolved, it's fair to say this, you know, we're not picking up games like, I'm not playing Double Dragon anymore, you know, like yeah. for 10 minutes and just moving on. It's yeah. like, you, you start to play a game like Fallout, yeah, man, you're invested. It's for, like, a, for a while, yeah. For a long Dark while. Dark Souls, and, yeah. that kind of stuff. But actually, when you brought up uh, other games that shall not be named as far as yeah. evolving, it's funny because we've spoken about that Fallout specific, a lot of our games specifically fall into that because there's this, the thing is that you get caught in this situation where you, you, gotta, you have to give the player what they expect, right? right? But at the same time, the player also expects change. Right. You know? So... How do you give the player something that still feels familiar and still feels new? You know, and that's when you start getting charge bars and stuff like that. I mean, you have to make the right decisions, but it's it's that kind of thing. What you know, what that's the balance that I think is really hard. That it's, actually you know, is the that's probably from a design perspective. If we were to strip away the the type of content or the the end result, I think that's a design conundrum. Yeah. On all levels of design, you yep. say, well, I have to remain fresh in my paintings, right? Mm -hmm. So I have to give the public what they've come to expect in some way that is still in my signature style, let's say, or my voice still has to be there. Right. I have to give the public a car that they expect. Ergo, you get a Mustang that is like an evolutionary yeah. process. You know, right. just watch a documentary on that. You can take yeah. the mic, please. So, I think one thing that helps us with that is that we try and give time between the releases. So again, the people who are trying to do it every year, they don't have time to figure that problem out. And the, the players don't have time to get space from that experience and then come back to it again. With a fresh perspective. Right, right. So everyone's so, coming back to it with right. a fresh perspective. Yeah, we, uh, we feel that, you know, if we were trying to do that kind of a game every year, it's not something we could necessarily deliver the same leap in experience right. that we're able to when we take our time on it. There's something to be said about that. I've been studying a lot of uh, metacognition in this regard and how there's that, that idea of taking time to think about things. And I think that this is, you know, we had the breakdown here of 2006, 2008, 2000. It seems that on, on an average, on three two and a half to three years, you are uh, coming out with an award-winning game, which is, seems to be that incubation period. I made a joke about Daniel Day-Lewis of video games, but I think that's, there's something to be said about that, that there is that period of incubation, period of reflection, reflecting on action and what happened and what worked. Mm -hmm. Then well, take uh, it away, yeah, please. The, the nice thing about our studios, we're not, you know, I mean, we have higher-ups that we do answer to, but I mean, in general... Well, like, how high do these higher-ups go? I mean, Well, they're higher, there's executives above. Are they taller you know? than usual? Or? <laughs> Some of them are... I always wonder about this. My tall. wife always says to me, they, they. Who are these they that they're always talking about? The, the, man. Nice the man. We love them. Yeah. They are He's very great. Look in his eyes. They are very great. They are the greatest people ever. No, want a they, drink? They're you good. Want some water? <laughs> I got some Kool-Aid in the back. I'm kidding. Nice. They're, no, they're, they're, they're good. Actually, they give us a lot of space. That's what I like, where, you know, you have a, these other 
studios working on their big corporations that shall not be named. But you know, yeah. And I'm sure they have a good setup, but it's they're beholden to investors and all these other things, you know, that uh, can affect that that development cycle. You got to put something out every year. There's an expectation, and you don't have time to iterate or come up with new stuff or come up with fresh ideas or let something just cook. So it comes out raw, and it's just you yeah. know. Um, um, that being said, there are certain games that probably lend themselves okay, like you know the Madden games and all. This. You know, people expect that. Point that updates. Works, I mean, you know? to me, that game like NHL tw uh, 2017 just came out, right? And uh, you know, pseudo nephew of mine says to me, uh, Uncle Louie, when are you coming over to play 2017? I said immediately. I can already expect to, to, to find what I expect to find. Right. Updated rosters, uh, right. things like that. Now, when they start messing with the controls, as they may have in <clears throat> that game, yeah. you know, some people kind of take a back. They take a back. They're taken aback by it. They say, Man, why did they change that? It was working fine. You know, it's like they've gone and changed the skill stick again or something. Now, Not throwing stones or anything, guys. <laughs> <Great game. laughs> the, the thing that does happen though with with our kind of development cycles is that you know you're working on something and then. Uh, something else comes out within that time that you were hoping you were going to bring something very fresh. You'd be the first. Yeah, and then well. something else comes time uh, and just kind of, and it doesn't take away from what you're doing, but it takes a little bit away from what you're doing. But, <laughs> yeah, you get a you little know, takes a little bit of the, the ribs, yeah, you know. It steals a little bit of thunder. And uh, you're just like, oh, sh you know, you can't talk about, oh, I'm sorry. Can I say? I'm sorry. Well, anyway. Yeah, this is, are you kidding me? We're live streaming. We're not on NBC, man. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm holding a microphone, so I just <laughs> yeah, Don't worry about it. Um, Nobody saw anything. They never heard anything. He didn't yeah, say anything. you heard nothing. No, but um, anyway, so, you know, that, that's one of the, what I think is kind of a negative in that regard. But okay. the positives definitely outweigh the negatives as far as our long yeah, development cycles. Yeah, I think so. You know? And the proof is in the pudding. The product is great. Now, moving beyond the product to the individuals here, because I know in any second that guy behind the camera is going to start spinning his fingers. Um, you guys hosted the workshop here at the summit. Yes. Talk a little bit more about Mr. Handy and the 3D print that you recently put out. Uh, that's a specific piece that you did. Yes. Is that uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I got I have, to, I have a B9 and I have an Ultimaker and um, I print as a hobby and I ended up taking the Mr. Handy and printing it out because I was like, why not print a robot, right? Nice robot, by the way. Thank you. Good finish. Thanks. Um, so. I built two so far. One that I gave to a friend who was the first prototype, and then the larger one that I ended up giving it to Todd Howard, and he was very grateful for. But um, it was interesting because using ZBrush to do that stuff, it's like I was able to have this thing in, in my presence and mm -hmm. hold it and kind of look at it, and it actually changed some of my designs. You know, in the actual game, being able to do that I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to change these joints. I'm going to because of your tacit relationship with the product. Yeah, and I was able to look at it and try these like mechanical joints in real life and all of a sudden right. oh they're not really they're not strong enough they're not uh versatile enough as far as their range so I, I went back to the game model well i'm very in, into like something being functional right so um you know and it altered some of that and just That's having perspective man yeah and just having something tangible it it it, it uh it invigorates you. You work on our project for three, four years. It's the kind of thing you, you start getting fatigued from the product. Yeah, some artistic fatigue and myopic sort of view of the product. And then to hold yeah. it, though, when I think... When you hold it, you are, you're just like... And even showing it at the studio, people yeah. get reactivated, reanimated. Because it's, like it's like a different... It steps into a different reality. You know, you're able to hold the thing. I, I remember yeah. my first print. I thought, man, it's alive. It's come off yeah. the screen. I thought, that's incredible, you know? And that, that's like the juice that keeps you going. Yeah, I remember watching the first print with my friend. We sat there for four hours just like... This is this cool. This is four hours at the office. You want to edit no. that part out. Hold on, no. Right four hours at home. At his home, in his home <laughs> life, in his home life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, work, I work every single minute of every single day when I'm at the studio. But it, you're raising a good point as well, and, and I want to get this, uh, I got to get this quick because they're going to be, yeah, you see that hand over there? The, uh, the hard surface work has maintained a tremendous organic quality, and I think it's derivative of that interaction that you have in the tacit realm. Mm -hmm. So thank you for letting us know that that's exactly what's been going on. I was yep. able to deduce that from just looking at the work. Yeah. I thought, oh, this is a nice, uh, nice approach. Over to Lucas Hardy, who apparently studied engineering in school, mm. but uh, has found his way. Are you moonlighting? Because your concept art, I've said this off camera, but I'll say it here now on the record, has a wonderful painterly quality to it. Oh, thank you. I'm a fan. It's really fresh, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, I mean that. It's not, it's, you know, cool. No lip service here. Um, this isn't the, that kind of back lounge. Um, Describe your approach to being so multifaceted. I mean, you must be a tremendous asset to your studio because you, you're sort of able to juggle many different hats. Well, I want to say, I want to back Take that microphone. Uh, he is. I just want to say that. They can't hear you, so you got to say he it. He is a tremendous asset to the studio. There you go. You've spoken like a true brother. <laughs> so tell us about I want to talk to you more about painting. Yeah. Because I really like your paintings. Um, tell us about your artistic pursuits and where you're coming from in that regard. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, I, I, I started off going to engineering school, but I was doing art in my spare time, just drawing and stuff like what that. What kind of engineering were you doing? Systems engineering, okay. which I don't use any of anymore, right. you know, but I, I picked up some programming skills in college. Sure. But then when I got into the industry, I was doing character art, and I got a chance working on, I was working on a game called Warhammer Online. Oh yeah, okay. I got a chance to do concept art, and basically through that job, I had the opportunity to paint a lot and got better and better and better at it. If I hadn't had that opportunity, I wouldn't really have gotten that chance to practice. Okay. But over the years, you know, like I'll spend a year doing this, a year doing that, picked up this bit of skill, that bit of skill, but that also has a downside, which means, you know, I got an opportunity to come here and, and talk about ZBrush. I had to take a couple months to make sure I, you know, I knew what I was talking about before I got on the stage because, okay. you know, I'm hopping around to this and hopping around to that. Um, so spread thin, I guess is the way you could say it. But I feel it the helps. same way sometimes. Yeah, it helps in a video game because... You know, you might start out at the beginning of the game needing to draw a lot, paint a lot, come up with ideas. And then the last year, you're fixing bugs, doing right. solving technical issues. So being able to do both helps, uh, helps ship the game, you know. And that ultimately, that's the end goal. So you work a lot very closely with the story team, I'm sure. Well, yeah, we've got uh, all kinds of disciplines in the studio doing, you know, anything, anything from uh, story to level design to programming. Cool. Environments. All kinds of stuff. Okay. Like I said, they're giving us the uh, the gears here. Um, is that it? We're giving the, yeah, they're giving us the, th I guess that's the end. Uh, you know, what can I say? I could keep going. They gave me some flack yesterday. So, uh, Lucas, and basically, um, I want to say, guys, thank you for that insight. Sure. Um, I also want to say thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, Bethesda Studios, again, before we go offline here. Uh, Keep up the good work to all that. You guys are only a small representation uh, right. of. Right. This is only a snapshot of this this studio. Um, you know can that. I, can I say something? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, please. Before we get off. Yeah. Here. Real quick, I just want to make sure that we thank all the fans. Because to be honest with you, I feel like we would not. Well, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the fans. We greatly appreciate. Um, you know the fan base and just how wonderful you guys are. The love that we get from you guys. The rest of the studio. I mean. All the other guys that, the, all the other individuals at the rest of the studio, um, in every department. I mean, this is absolutely a team effort. Yeah. We've brought up stuff that other people have worked on that they, they're not here now, but we hopefully have represented all of you well. And um, we're grateful, we're honored to be working with the rest of you guys as well. Spoken like a gentleman. Yeah. Here we go, right yeah. from the bunker here inside the Novan Green Screen Hangar in Hollywood, California, in the shadow of the Hollywood sign. Dennis Mejiones. Yes. Correctly said, of course. Of course. Uh, like a true Spaniard. I'm actually Italian. Uh, Canadian. And Mr. Hardy, we are off. Back to you in the main green screen hangar. Paul, Gabriel, and the rest of the team. We'll catch you in a few. Bye. That's a wrap.